I'll do that too. Thanks, Owen. Kia ora, everybody. Um, welcome to one of the bravest talks, I believe, at this conference. Uh, thank you for being here. You've chosen to come to the session about uh, mental fatigue and burnout when you could be putting the fun back into functional cal calculus next door. So my name is Ruth McDavitt. Um, my role here in the room is to keep our kōrero inside 30 minutes. Um, this is not going to be easy. We have five amazing panellists who are ready to share um, their stories with you. We're hoping to have some time for discussion and Q&As at the end, but I'm not promising anything. If we do do questions, we're going to curate them quite carefully uh, through the Slack channel. Um, so inside the NZ JavaScript Slack, there is a channel called DevPression, kind of like depression, but with a V for the devs. You're welcome to post questions in there, or if you, if you want to, you can send me a direct message. So I'm Ruth in Slack. So we are hoping to have some space at the end for some discussion, but I really want to make some space uh, for the topic of the day, which is burnout. So I'll start with a quick definition, if you will, um, although burnout um, manifests differently for everybody. Occupational burnout is defined as exhaustion, lack of enthusiasm, and an overall feeling of ineffectiveness in the workplace. Most of us have or will experience burnout at some stage in our professional career, um, and also it's at a lot of stages in our educational careers as well. Um, it's so prevalent as a group, as a society, we're really scared to talk about it. Um, help is available, but because we're not talking about it enough, um, it's often really, really challenging to get it out in the open. So the goal for today is to really start a discussion around it um, and help people st uh, to stop suffering unnecessarily and realise that they're not alone. We are going to be sharing some um, personal stories, so I just wanted to just make a really quick note that we have an awesome code of conduct. The, the short version is, be nice, please bring your respect and love for our panellists who are about to share some pretty, pretty amazing personal stories with you. Um, that's pretty much all I've got. I'm going to be introducing our panellists one by one and they're going to be um, sharing some personal stories as we go. First up, I'm going to introduce Dana. And I'll pass the talking stick at her. Dana, is, Dana Eti is a developer. She's got eight years experience as a developer, currently working as a, at a product company here in Wellington. Kia ora, Dana. I think it's on. Thank you for being on our panel. So, I hear that you're a bit of a high achiever. Yeah? I was just wondering if you could tell us about that and your approach sure. to coding. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Cool. Well, yeah, I am. And because of that, I'm, I'm actually quite prone to, being, uh, to burning out quite a lot. Um, so, not only that, I also feel like I have to prove myself as well. Um, so I've experienced quite a few of the signs that come with burnout, like insomnia, anxiety, especially um, during stand-up, sometimes before, sometimes during. But um, I get through it, and that's because I'm actually quite lucky to be working in a good environment right now. Um, so, um, In my 20s, um, I became what I would call addicted to coding. I see coding like gaming. Um, of course, like, a lot of people like gaming. You know, it can be quite addictive as well. Um, but I used to stay up quite late, like crazy late. And the reason why is because I was constantly trying to learn and do as much as I could. Like, I wanted to learn everything. Um, um, so when I was freelancing, I took on design, um, front-end, and back-end. And I actually got quite burnt out. I got burnt out to the point where I couldn't stare at my keyboard anymore. But I've managed to overcome it and learn ways to get through it. So, um, I'm not saying that wanting to do everything is a bad thing, because, you know, like, um, demanding tasks are opportunities. Um, high achievers enjoy challenges, um, and those who strive to do more, whoops, <laughs> do more should be able to wherever they are working. Um, so high achievers pour so much time and energy into acquiring knowledge and perfecting their craft. And of course, we see them a lot in 
um, we see them active in the community. And I believe that high achievers bring value. So, um, one of the reasons why I'm passionate about this topic is because there are so many amazingly talented developers that are going through this right now. Um, <clears throat> and we as an industry, we need them. The last thing we want for any developer, especially recent graduates, is to go down a spiral and feel like they're alone. One thing that helps me to get through is having a clarity of purpose, um, which also builds resilience. Resilience is like mental toughness. It gives you the capacity to bounce back from difficulties. Um, I'm also partly deaf, so I apologize if you guys can't understand me. Um, if this is being filmed, I hope it comes with closed captions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's when you're faced with obstacles, stress, environmental threats, um, that resilience or the lack of it starts to emerge. Um, this industry can be tough, it's fast paced. And New Zealand needs developers. So we should look out for those who may be experiencing mental fatigue. But like I said, having a clarity of purpose helps me. We're in an amazing time right now. Tech is awesome, it's really cool. And I think being able to talk about this topic um, is an indicator that as an industry, we can solve this, solve this. Because after all, that's what we do. We solve things. Um, yeah, so I don't have much time left, but I just want to end it on asking you all a question. Um, why do you do what you do? And what is your purpose? If you don't have one, um, create one. That's me. Nice. Kia ora. Thank you, Dana. Thanks. Nice to end on a question, and I really like the tips and that respect for that early career, because I know what that's like, you get chucked in the deep end. Um, next up, we have Samson. Um, Samson's worked in, tech, in the tech industry for nine years, mostly in small to medium-sized companies as a contractor, part of a startup, and also as an employee. Um, Samson, we've spoken about the cyclical nature of burnout. I'm just wondering if you could sh share some of that with us. Yeah, thank you for that, Ruth. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to cover, um, was just my experience um, over the last nine-ish years um, working in the industry uh, because I have noticed uh, we do occasionally talk, burnout occasionally does come up as a topic, um, but I think sometimes it's talked about in a way that you get burnout, you either leave the industry or you figure out a way to solve it and then it's done. Um, whereas in my experience, I found that um, it certainly it comes and goes. Um, and. I want to talk a little bit about it in the different uh, types of work I've done, also the different experience levels. Um, <clears throat> so when I first came to New Zealand, um, I had about two years of, uh, of work experience, and I started in a company um, in Spiral where I was doing contracting. Um, so that lasted for about three or so years. Um, and so with two years of experience, I still felt fairly new to the industry. Um, I was surprised that it was actually you know, people were, you know, I went to do contracts, you know, getting paid for it. Um, very pleased, certainly, but, um, you know, it was, it was still something that was a bit surprising to me. And, um, you know, with the nature of contracts, though at least the ones that I was working on, um, there was new ones coming every few weeks, every couple, few months, a uh, couple of months and so on. And so that meant you were constantly in a cycle of um, pitching yourself, of selling yourself, of, um, telling people what you knew, even if sometimes you didn't fully believe it yourself. And I found that um, with that cycle, if in the evenings or in the weekends, it, it felt like to me that I was, at the beginning, there was imposter syndrome. Um, for those that aren't aware what imposter syndrome is, it's um, this idea that you, when you tell people something you know, when you tell people that you know something, but you don't necessarily believe it yourself. Um, and 
so I think a lot of people identify with that at the beginning of their career, and so that was something I was overcoming, trying to spend all my free time learning, trying to catch up. How do I look, how do I know more about Rails? How do I learn more about jQuery? How do I learn more about just JavaScript in general? All the new frameworks came later on, um, and. Um, and so there was that part of it with imposter syndrome. But even once I got over that, um, there was just the run-in to keep up. And that's, I think, with things like the JavaScript frameworks and so on. It's like everybody's talking about these cool new technologies and things. It's like, I don't know those technologies. Um, I have to spend my weekends and evenings you know, learning about those things. Otherwise, I'll be left behind. Um, or you know, somebody's doing this really cool thing with AI. I heard about it, but I don't know about that. So they're better than me. So now I have to spend my evenings and weekends catching up. And um, I found, I talked to Oren about this at one point in my career as well. It's like um, just before I started doing teaching at um, Spiral Dev Academy, um, which I did for two years, um, I was in a place where contracts, you know, I didn't feel right charging somebody an hour because I didn't feel like I was productive in that, enough in that hour because it would spend me, like, it would take me two hours to do something that I felt would normally take me an hour because of burnout and, so like, such, and stuff like that. Um, and that also happened in uh, startups as well. I was in a startup for a period, um, and we didn't take fully into account um, the idea of diminishing returns, and, um, and so we're working very long hours and so on. Um, and I, uh, uh, so, that, so those are the kinds of things that I wanted to, people to be aware of. You know, um, happens in contracting, happens uh, especially in startups. I think there's a huge pressure for that. Um, and I think there's also potential pressure for that uh, in employment as well, is if you're trying to do your personal projects on top of the work that you do at work. Um, sometimes there can be a thing as well. So the one thing I wanted to finish on was um, I think it's really important to find something that isn't related to computers. I, I, I try my best to have at least one thing that's not a computer-related thing. And if you can do that, then that's, you're, you're on a good, good start. So thank you. Kia ora, Samson. Thank you. I so knew we were going to struggle. I mean, the can of worms, just by saying imposter syndrome, we could be here for four hours. But that was a, it's a really good discussion starter, so thank you. Um, next up, we have Oren Shaw, a DevOps consultant. She's been working in her own company for the last two years, so probably knows about that whole diminishing returns, charging for your time thing. And Oren's major focus is understanding the cultural changes necessary in an organization for DevOps, um, how our existing cultures are filled with mechanisms um, that actually worsen the mental health of the people in tech. Oren. Yeah, that's kind of my focus. Hi. Hi. Um, just touching on kind of what um, Dinah and Samson have said already is, I have imposter syndrome. I don't feel like I belong sitting right here on this panel or even with all of you cool folk. Like I do DevOps things, I do backend, I don't know JavaScript. I mean, kind of do. I can read it-ish, you know, a little bit. Um, so I don't feel like I belong here and that's something I'm struggling with as I'm talking to you. Um, as Ruth said, I started my own company about two years ago. The year leading up to that, I had burned out so hard that I had to spend two months doing nothing. Like actually, literally, getting out of bed that day was an achievement, nothing. Um, and a lot of things led up to that. Um, just kind of referencing Dana and the passion thing, that was kind of the trigger. Over the 10 years before that, when I joined the industry, this idea of passion, this idea of you must be into computers, you must want to computers, um, the jargon file, which you may not have heard of, was one of the seminal things at my, when, I, when I joined, which talked about larval stage, quote unquote, which was this idea that um, as a learning developer, as you were growing through it, you would have to go on these long, in-depth programming adventures where you're supposed to spend weeks on no sleep, staying up till 3 a.m. doing code, or you wouldn't be considered a dev. You couldn't consider yourself to be any good. Um, and this was the same sort of thing baked into everyone around me. Everyone around me had grown up in this culture, had internalized it to the point where like, oh, she's good because she's passionate like we are. That was the stamp of you're okay. That was the stamp of you belong with us. That's a horrifying stamp. That's a stamp that everything Samson said of, I have to work evenings and weekends to keep up, to feel like I still belong, to feel like I'm still worthy of that passionate stamp where the only thing I get to do with my day is go to work and type on a computer and go home and have some food, maybe, 
if I remember to order pizza. <laughs> and then type some more. What else is there in my life at that point? Where is the room for people and friends and relationships and going out and doing these sorts of things? Like, um, every time I come to conferences, I see people on their laptops coding while they're in talks. Not to shame any of you who are actually doing that right now, <laughs> um, but it, it's not you, it's the culture around that, that we must always be productive, that we must always be doing this thing, which is that passionate narrative, which is so toxic, which led to me being unable to do anything for two months and then have to spend another six to eight months getting to the point where I could even work a full day. One of my major coping strategies that came out of that was having to learn where my breakpoints are, where I can't anymore, and what's going to precede that. So what Samson was talking about, the cyclic nature of it, how it comes and goes, it grows and fades, and needing to, as Samson said, um, do things that aren't computing. I take photos. This is like my major other thing that I do. And a lot of that is computering because I have to you know, edit the photos. But a lot of that's like, now I'm going on a walk in the bush and there's things I can take photos of, yay. That's cool. I can almost do like a full editing pipeline on my phone, which is even cooler. And I kind of also want to end on a bit of a question, which is, why are you doing this? What around you, what is the cultural drives around you that say, I need to be this, I must be this? Have you asked? Have you interrogated? Have you decided? Have you chosen to do these things? And if so, why? Thank you. Thank you, Oren. I love the trend of asking the questions of the audience. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Matt Powell. Matt is a software developer. He's also a theatre maker um, who has also always felt overwhelmed easily in social groups, open plan offices and large meetings. Over to you, Matt. Hi. Um, so I would say that my experience with burnout is on the scale of more hours and days than weeks and months. Um, I often get to the end of the day and feel like I haven't accomplished anything. Um, I get very distracted very easily. Um, I tune out in meetings. I'll get to, the st get to the end of a conversation and have to ask the person that I'm talking to to repeat the entire thing because like, I'll realise that I haven't heard any of it, um, which is incredibly frustrating. Um, and, and it does over time kind of eat away at you. Like if you're constantly being distracted, you can't focus enough to get the tasks done that you feel like you should be able to, to do, uh, and you, you feel like you never get anything finished. Um, and meanwhile, you, you, you feel busy all the time. Um, my brain is constantly uh, yelling at me, look at this, look at this, look at this, um, and I have immense trouble keeping track of what this is referring to, which is why I program in JavaScript. Um, but after about four years of um, trying to cope with the aftermath of the Christchurch earthquake, um, I was seeing a counsellor for uh, anxiety and she just suggested, hey, has anyone ever considered the possibility that you might have ADHD? Um, <laughs> and so, uh, long story short, after spending a few months on a waiting list, I spent several hundred dollars to see a psychiatrist um, and scored the first perfect test score of my life because I didn't have to study for it, um, <laughs> uh, which was um, a 36 point checklist for ADHD. Um, and there's like, that's just a label, it's just a, a handle that I can put on what my brain does to me. And like Ritalin is great, it's magical, um, but it's, it's not a cure, it's like figuring out that this is what's going on is the start of a conversation. Um, and that's opened up like a whole bunch of things for me that I can use to deal with the way that my brain is. Like now I know that if I have three hours of meetings in a day and someone goes, oh great, there's a gap, I'm gonna schedule another meeting with Matt, I need to like say to them, hey, that's too many meetings in one day for me, I can't do that many meetings today. Um, let's do it tomorrow or let's do it next week. Um, it allows me to 
talk to my managers and say, hey, the, the floor's too noisy today, I'm going to go and work downstairs or I'm going to go and work from home this afternoon. Um, it allows me to talk to my team and say, hey, if we're going to talk about this, can we book a room to do it because I can't have this conversation on the floor where there are 70 other devs trying to have conversations and do work. Um, so it's not like, it's not that I can take those four letters and, and just put them into my life and go, hey, look at me, this is, this is my excuse, but it does give me a way to, like a framework for dealing with that stuff um, and a, I guess a background that I can, that I can give to people who I'm talking to um, and, and people who I'm dealing with to say, hey, this is why I'm asking these things. Um, and, and people, when you, when you start from that um, kind of, when you start from that way of looking at things that's like, this is, this is why I want to do things differently, um, people I've found are really receptive to that and really open to it um, and are gonna, well, in my experience at least, have treated me really kindly and really openly. Um, but it's, it's giving yourself permission to talk about those things and to be open and honest with yourself, first of all. Thank you, Matt. We are doing awesome, team. We have got at least seven minutes left. For our final panelist, who will not take the entire time, this is Alex Gibson. So Alex is a software engineer. He's really passionate about building a culture within our industry that's going to support mental diversity. Alex, you've had some personal experience with burnout. Can you share, please? Sure. Um, kia ora, everyone. So I'm probably burnt out right now, or very close to it, which is ironic since I'm on a panel talking about burnout. Uh, I've experienced burnout multiple times during my career um, as a developer. I've also experienced burnout in uh, university, and I've also experienced it as a mechanic in a completely different industry. So it's not localized to just us. I have type 1 bipolar disorder, um, and for those that don't know, it, type 1 bipolar is uh, a disorder which enables, which it, it makes me go to states of depression where I've got little to no enthusiasm to do anything. Basically, I just want to hide in bed all day um, with the sheets over my head. And then I have uh, periods of mania. So the best way to describe that would be a, a state of euphoria where I have a lot more enthusiasm to do typical things. I, there's a, a psychological theory called spoon theory, and I urge people to look it up. It, it sounds ridiculous, but it's great at explaining these things. And basically, you have a set amount of spoons that you can use on things in any given day. When I'm manic, I have more spoons than I do on average. I have a lot more spoons to give out. But the more spoons I give out, the higher I go in my mania, and then I come crashing down. And that ties quite closely into my burnout. So the way I deal with it, is I have a support network. My friends and my family know about my burnout. They know about my bipolar disorder and they know my triggers. And then they know what to look for in my personality and say, hey Alex, it looks like you're pretty manic right now because you're talking incredibly fast and I can't understand what you're saying. When they say things like that, that gives me the warning signs I need to take action and do things about where I'm going. If I'm too manic, I'll force myself to sleep. I'll start doing things to try and ease off the accelerator and when I'm too depressed I'll try and stop doing work I'll try and I'll forcibly make myself healthier it's to me it's all about support networks so I urge everyone to to just talk to their family if they're experiencing problems in, in mental health or burnout it's all about starting these conversations that we as an industry don't have we don't talk enough about our personal feelings and the hardships that we go through just being honest with everyone, being honest with your employer to say, hey, I'm not feeling well mentally. Another, I'm not sick, I don't have the flu, but mentally I can't be at work because like Matt said, I'm drained, I just, I'm not gonna be any good if I come to work. Employers should embrace that and, and trust that you'll take the time off that you need to become better because if, if we keep on cracking the whip and if we keep on driving ourselves to always churn out productive code, we're just heading for burnout. And it's a horrible thing as an industry, and even as a society, to do. I'll leave it at that so we can talk about other fun issues. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
thank you to all our amazing panellists. We do have one question from the Slacks, um, and it's about the prevalence of real-time chat tools. Like, how, how, how do you switch off? How do you explain that you're switching off? How can you reset those expectations? Does anyone want to grab the mic and answer that one? Um, yeah, I close them, and then I take my laptop and an iPad that has 3G, and I go somewhere that doesn't have Wi-Fi, and then no one can reach me. It's actually really great. But I still have access to the internet, so I can look stuff up, because like, I'm useless without Google and Stack Overflow. Awesome. Thank you, Oren. Um, one more question, and I was just going to ask, how is it for us, how, what are the best ways for us to support each other? And I mean in society, and I mean in the workplace. Like, what, what do you wish that your colleagues and your friends and families were doing to support you when you're in the burnout phase? What's one thing I can do today? Ooh. Go, Alex. So I was briefly touching on this before. Um, the initial conversation to have your, with your family is hard. I still remember when I told my father, um, who is, for all of the New Zealanders out there, he's a staunch New Zealander male. Um, if it wasn't for the, the likes of, uh, is it Stephen Kerwin, the, the rugby player, is that right? Yeah, he did a, an amazing uh, advertising series on TV where he talked about his depression if it wasn't for him, I don't think a lot of these, I think a lot of these uh, baby boomer type men would just completely disregard mental illness. So that happened after I told my dad. I told him, and he said, oh, yeah, you'll get over it, right? And it's just like, no, I have a mental illness. This is not something I recover from. Like, I can get better, but I'm never going to be fully. And he's just like, okay, you'll get over it. <laughs> sure. That initial conversation is really hard, but as a society, we're talking about it more and more. So it's great to see that people are starting to understand and starting to have those conversations. But the one thing that I think needs to happen is more discussion, just more conversations. Everything can be, be solved just through conversations. If we start talking about it, we can start talking about the solutions. And, and from the solutions that we talk about, we can just derive actions. And those actions can solve the problems that we have in society. But it all starts with the discussion. Nice, and we are out of time, unless Matt's going to be really fast. Oh, I, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that like, sometimes those conversations can be really positive too. Like when I Skyped to my parents to tell them about my diagnosis, um, something clicked for them when I, while I was on the call, and we realised that while I'd been living with ADHD undiagnosed for 36 years, my dad had been living with it for 64 years. Um, and now he's getting help and learning to understand that as well. Um, and that's awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. We're just about to get kicked out of the room and move on to the next talk. Just to recap the homework, spoon theory, look it up. Um, answer the questions, why are you doing this? What is your passion? Go outside, take a photo, get into nature, support each other. Um, keep talking. Uh, so there's the DevPress channel, but there's humans around us for the rest of our lives. So please um, join with me in thanking our amazing panelists for sharing their stories and each other for coming along. <laughs> <laughs>